To trim horses in North America, South America, it's quite common to buy a quality professional nipper. It has a flat bit, fairly good width, not as much depth between the blade and the post as when we get to our shoe pullers, but a quality professional nipper, when you squeeze the handle, you can see daylight through the bit, and you just squeeze and the daylight disappears that's a very sharp, professional quality nipper, and it makes your job really easy. Learn to imagine a centering post in every nipper that you ever grab. And if you're tipping your nipper, the post, it's an imaginary line. You need to hold your nipper so this imaginary post is perpendicular to the surface you're wanting to establish. When you realize you have a centering post, an imaginary line right in the middle of those nippers, you'll stop coming all the way down. You'll stop tipping all the way to the side. You'll stop gouging a hoof wall and trimming feet more than what you intended to. Learn to follow your centering post. Use your nipper, cut a full bite. This is an inch wide. Open them, twist your hand, and walk it forward about a quarter of an inch. Close them again. As you're opening and closing and cutting hoof wall, keep your eye on the outside edge. You don't have to worry about the inside bit because it's following in the track that was already established by your cutting blade. You will get very proficient with your nippers keeping track of the imaginary centering post and walking your nipper trimming bit by bit. You need a quality rasp. This happened to be a little wider than some, but I get a few more horses. It doesn't have as so much pressure on my shoulder. The typical horseshoeing rasps are 14 inch platers special. And whatever you use for rasp won't matter. They'll have a coarse side and a smooth side, smooth, smooth teeth on each side. When I'm backing up feet, moving a lot of hoof wall, I glide the rasp. You want to learn to float a rasp in such a way that you try not to cut anything. And then the hoof chips will just fly. If you have a new rasp and you start pushing on it, it'll bite, it'll jump, you won't get anything done. So learn to float your rasp. If you have a high spot, come across your foot, take the high spot down. Always come across the foot, take the high spot down. You level the whole plane, and then drag up your heel on the right, drag up your heel on the left. Get an absolute flat surface. We'll show you how to concave the entire parameter so that as you get more experienced shoeing, you'll stop putting flat shoes on flat feet. But we'll cover that at a later time. A nailing hammer can be from about 10 to 16 ounces. This particular design is after the Calvary nailing hammer has a longer snout so that if I'm shoeing a colt, it's the first time he's been shod, I reach across the shoe, I start my nail, now I put down pressure on his frog, stop the vibration, and I can drive across the top of my hand to drive nails while I compress that frog. It's a really good trick on horses that are scared of driving nails. Cup it, have a nailing hammer with a longer snout like the old Calvary hammer and you'll be happy. If you learn to drive with a 10 ounce hammer, you'll drive nails more accurately. If you start using too heavy a hammer to drive your nails, too much force, too fast, they all come out low, you don't get the accuracy. Clinchers for once you've nailed, bent your ring off over, bent your nail over. When my son was seven years old, he wanted to help me clinch. So I started using my old wore out hoof nippers. We use them because they're sharp, very little effort. And Caleb started clinching for me when he was seven years old. We have the old saddle horse clinchers like this. Nowadays, there's a popularity has a curved jaw. With less strength, you get a tighter clinch. These are the low nail or saddle horse clinchers, 
These are the curved jaw clinchers. We've already shown you how it is we'd like you to learn to block with just a block under the head of the nail and use the hammer to make a clinch. Clinch block is just a heavy piece of steel with a sharp edge. It's been almost 30 years ago since I set out with a band saw and tried to saw this straight along this side so I could shoe a horse faster. I was going to clinch all four nails just by moving my block using this side. I got that way through twice, ruined two bands on the band saw, and that just ends up being a souvenir, I guess. Hoof knives are judged by which hand, with your palm up, does it cut coming towards you. Right hand, palm up, it's a right-handed knife. Left-handed knife would curve this way, your left hand coming towards you. So where are we? Nipper's knife rasp, shoe pull-offs. They've got a greater distance, greater purchase. They're heavier metal. They're heavier jaws. To properly use your shoe pull-offs, start at the very utmost rearward heel and close your handles completely. If your jaws are partway open, when you pry, the inside jaw of your pull-off puts pressure on the sole. So it's critical to pull the shoe. You close the handles completely, but now if I'm between my front legs and I'm just pushing to the air, I can't get any leverage. I have to get something underneath the face of that hoof so I get some mechanical power to pry that shoe off. So we turn a little bit sideways with the handles completely closed, we pry down over the post of our leg. The face of the hoof is above your knee and you rinse it that way. Maybe it's here and you go this way. But the secret is pry, then only move your pull-offs an eighth or quarter inches forward, pry the second time, only move them a quarter inch forward, pry the third time. You will really work too hard and won't get a shoe pulled if you start at the heel, jump ahead half an inch or an inch, you lose your mechanical advantage. So as you're pulling shoes, walk your pull-offs forward an eighth to a quarter inch at a time. When the last nail is still in there, pull back towards you. If you only have one nail holding that shoe and you roll it off the toe, sometimes you break a chunk of foot out. Hammers for shaping shoes. A lot of people use a three pound hammer. At about the age of 28, I had carpal tunnel, was supposed to get surgery on both arms. They hurt so bad. An old Finnish blacksmith, I went into the hills there in the Ponderay Forest. He looked at all my three pound hammers when I showed up to shoe his draft horses. He said, do your wrists ever hurt? I said, yeah, I got carpal tunnel real bad and I'm gonna get surgery done this winter. He said, if you throw away those Tinker Toy hammers and get yourself a hammer, he says, your wrist will stop hurting. This is a four pound. To shape a shoe, if you have a hammer that you can lift and drop, it takes all the pressure off your wrist, your carpal tunnel, your elbow. But don't drop it on any one of these fingers, you will lose a fingernail. Here happens to be a six pound sledge. I bought it as a sledge years ago, sawed the handle off, made it kind of pretty. Professional hockey players always would put electrical tape around the end of their stick so when they're skating fast in the ice, they know where the end of that stick is. So I was encouraged to put tape on the end of my hammer handle because you end up not letting it fly out of your hand. You know where the end is before you get to it. So we've got three hammers that we use for shaping shoes. We've got a hammer here for driving nails. We've got clinch blocks. This is the... Sometimes the shoes you get are really hard. And if you get a forge and want to learn to shape shoes hot, they shape easier. But then you have to start using forge tongs and it takes the jar out of this wrist holding a, hand, holding a shoe. Forge tongs are kind of a luxury and a forge is a luxury, but it's an entirely art all in itself to be able to use forge tongs to handle a hot shoe 
to be able to shape it. If you're a cold shoer and shaving with a cold hammer, it's a little different practice, but how you shape the shoe doesn't really matter. These particular shoe spreaders are something that I use because I don't like making mistakes. <laughs> sometimes I can spread a shoe and not have to pull it, and sometimes I have to pull the shoe and redo it. But do what the horse needs. And last but not least, this is a stall jack that a fellow put together for me years ago. This used to be take apart. The legs used to screw out. When he built it for me in about 1976, he painted it gold for all the money it was going to make me. I used to put it in a suitcase and fly to different paramutual tracks. It's just uh, something we use when we're shoeing light, light shoes. We use this instead of an anvil. You can get a lot of horses shod with a stall jack. These are a good part of the tools you'll need depending on budget. You'll learn to improvise. I hope everybody that owns a horse learns to trim and shoe their own horse and have some fun with it.